So we are going to read now from the Bible uh, and continuing on in Matthew. Matthew chapter 21 is where we're reading from. I'll give you a moment to find that. We're going to be reading from verse 1 through to verse 27 of Matthew chapter 21. says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately, the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, Not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Well, good day, everybody. I don't know if this is working yet. We're, we're good. Good morning. Do you like the shirt? I wore a, it was a bit of a dreary morning, so I thought I'd wear something nice and bright so uh, to keep you awake. But uh, great to see you here. I don't know if it's great for you to see me, but my name is Matthew, and uh, I'm a part of the church family here at Christ Central. I'm also an ordained Presbyterian minister. Don't hold that against me. But uh, it's my privilege to look at the Bible with you, so let's do that now. Uh, we, we might just pray, and then we'll get into it. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you that you are a God who reveals yourself. We pray that we would have ears to hear what you're going to say to us today. Uh, give us hearts that are willing to believe, and give us hands that are ready to do your kingdom work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was at a party recently, that's right, a party, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and one of the best parts about the party was getting to talk to some young people. Now, what I define as young people is getting, uh, it's a bit of 
a bigger sort of bandwidth of age groups now as I'm turning 50 this year, so... But I was talking to teenagers, and it was great. They were amazing, they were funny, they were sometimes quirky, and I just loved it. But for me, the best part of the night was also the saddest. Because I got to talking to a few of these young people about God and religion and Jesus. It was great to talk to them because they were very curious people, they had lots of interesting things to say. But it was also sad because at least the ones I talked to had very little knowledge of Jesus. They knew almost nothing about Christianity or what the Bible teaches. Most of the things that they said sounded like they've come from the internet, on Instagram or YouTube or whatnot. Now, I don't want to alarm you, but not everything on the internet is true, all right? So I'm sorry to break it to you. But that's especially true when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to Jesus. When you're on the internet, you've got to, it's the wild, wild west. You've got to be really careful. And so as I was talking to these young people, I was sad because not only did they not know much about Jesus, it didn't seem to me that they'd arrived at any real understanding of why they even exist. What is the actual purpose of them breathing and walking around? I couldn't tell that they knew. Their conception of the world and their place in it seemed, seemed very incomplete. And I don't mean to disrespect them, they were beautiful people, but, and it was only a chat at a party, but... I found this other places as well, and I'm sure you have, my work in the funeral industry. Most of the people I've met know almost nothing about Jesus. Almost nothing. And few of them seem to have really thought deeply about any of the big questions of life. Certainly from my conversations with them, I couldn't tell they'd ever really processed much. And you probably know people like that too. It's a huge concern in our culture, isn't it? Many people are uninformed, they're misinformed, they're sceptical, or they're just distracted. Which is why our series looking into the Gospel of Matthew is so important, because Matthew's Gospel is written so we'll have a deeper understanding of two things. Number one, who Jesus is, who really is Jesus of Nazareth, and number two, what has he come to do? What's he all about? That's what Matthew's Gospel is all about, isn't it? I think you know that, certainly if you've been here for any amount of time, I think you've picked up on the vibe of Matthew's Gospel. But that's why Matthew's Gospel starts the way it does, right back in chapter 1, verse 1. It starts like this, it says, uh, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that means Matthew is saying from the get-go that Jesus is, well, he's the son of David, isn't he? What does that mean? That means he's the king that God promised to send into the world. It also says he's the son of Abraham. And what does that mean? Well, that means that God had promised long ago to Abraham that he would bless the world through his family. Somehow, someway, blessing was going to come into this messy world. Jesus is that, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's the promised king who brings true blessing to people of every nation. Folks, that's the first sentence of the New Testament. It's telling us up front, super, just crystal clear, who Jesus is. And by the time you get to chapter 21, as we start to get close to, I guess, to the end of the story of Matthew, we begin to find out a few things. Who Jesus is and what he's come to do come into focus even more. It becomes clearer and more urgent. And so in our uninformed and misinformed and sceptical and distracted society, we need to pay close attention to what's being said here. Because if we're not crystal clear on who Jesus is, how can we expect anyone else to be? But as we watch Jesus here in chapter 21, who Jesus is becomes clearer and more urgent and more beautiful. And for what we can tell, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on the Sunday in the lead up to the Passover festival. I don't know if you know about the Passover festival, but the Passover was basically the biggest event in Israel's calendar. It was kind of like the Eka, except bigger and no rides, right? There were were animals and there was noise and there were crowds. Passover is about when they celebrate how God delivered their people from slavery in Egypt long ago and how God brought them 
into the promised land, the land he had sworn that he would give to them. And in the time of Jesus, emotions ran high at Passover because the Jews were sick and tired of the Romans. They were being ruled by them. Passover became a reminder that God, though he delivered them from slavery in Egypt all those years ago, they were still oppressed. They were still under the thumb. And they want the Romans gone. Many of them wanted the Messiah to come. They wanted the Messiah, this true king, to show up and conk the Romans' heads together and get rid of them. And in the middle of all this emotion and frustration and expectation, Jesus arrives. And he shows that he is the Messiah they've been looking for. The start of Matthew chapter 21, there's a quote from the prophet Zechariah that talks about the Messiah. I just want to quote from the book of Zechariah itself. It says, See your king comes to you lowly and riding on a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The prophecy is the Messiah will come on a donkey of all things. And when he comes, he's going to restore peace. He's going to have victory and he's going to rule. And so in Matthew chapter 21, at the very start when some Jews see Jesus deliberately getting on a donkey and riding into Jerusalem, they put two and, to get two, and two together. It's very clear to them what he's saying. This miracle worker, this prophet from Galilee, he's claiming to be the promised king. He's claiming to be the Messiah. And they knew the prophecy that the Messiah would ride into town on a donkey. And so, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus does that to deliberately disclose who he is. You know, in other parts, if you've read other parts of the Gospels, you'll see Jesus at times telling people to be quiet. He'll heal someone and say, Shh, don't tell anyone. Don't reveal who I am to people yet. But here, he's advertising it. He's making a statement. He's saying, oh, you've heard about the Messiah, have you? Well, that's me. And the crowds respond with excitement. Chapter 21 from verse 9, the, the crowds cry out, don't they? They say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're shouting Hosanna, and which basically means save. It's kind of a word of hopeful praise. They're praising because here is the Son of David. And that's a big call, calling someone the son of David, the son. To call Jesus that is a pretty big deal. It, it calls to mind another ancient promise that God made, this time to King David, about a thousand years before Jesus. Here's what God promised to King David. He said, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The promise of a forever king in the line of David. Israel had a lot of kings, didn't they? But they weren't much chop, at least most of them. Their rule never lasted and none of them really brought lasting peace to this so-called promised land. So what God's people need is a king who can get the job done. A king whose rule will never end. A king who brings a peace that never ends. And so as Jesus, this miracle-working prophet, this teacher, as he rides into Jerusalem, the, it seems like the Israelites are rolling out the red carpet. They understand what he's saying. It's time to get pumped. Hosanna to the son of David. Here comes the king. Look out, Romans. But when Jesus enters the city, the whole picture changes. When Jesus gets inside the city of Jerusalem, there's curiosity, there's a bit of a stir, you know, there's a bit of concern, but there's not much cheering. It says in verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, well, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, I don't know as we read that whether that struck you as a little bit weird. One minute people are crying out, hooray, here comes the son of David, yay. 
the next minute other people are saying, who's this guy? Imagine, imagine this. You knew I was going to mention Taylor Swift today. Uh, it's just one of those things. But imagine all these people lining up to the Taylor Swift concert, right, in Sydney. And when they get inside the, the concert and they take their seats and Taylor Swift appears in that, that sparkly thing she wears, half of the people turn to each other and go, who's that? Wouldn't that strike you as a bit weird? Wouldn't that be strange? That's kind of what's happened here. People are outside the gate welcoming Jesus into the city. They're putting their cloaks on the ground and branches and they're cheering. Here comes the Messiah. Here comes the son of David. He's going to rule forever. Here comes peace. Goodbye, Romans. He gets inside the city. Who's that guy? That's strange, isn't it? It's almost symbolic or indicative of the state of Israel at the time. On the face of it, from a distance, it seems Jerusalem is welcoming home its true king, the Messiah. But you get inside and you see the reality. It's a kind of a different picture. It looks like most people really don't get who Jesus is. And I guess it's not just a problem we face today, is it? Even in Jesus' day, even when he was right there, people struggled to understand him. And while that's not a good thing, it's also, I guess, an opportunity for us. For us to tell people about him. To do that respectfully and clearly and patiently. The lack of knowledge of Jesus and the, and the misinformation that's all around, that's not, just a, that's not just a problem, it's an opportunity for us to, to help people understand more clearly. I don't mean pester people, just provide something helpful that's going to point them in the right direction. And I guess that's what Matthew's Gospel is doing, isn't it? It's there to inform us about who Jesus is, and what he's there to do, to clear all that up. And we learn more about that as chapter 21 continues. Jesus goes into the temple, doesn't he? The temple was huge. Uh, I think it was more than 35 acres in size, the whole complex. Now, I'm not sure how big an acre is. I just think that sounds pretty big. 35 acres, that is a huge place. Very impressive. One of the wonders of the ancient world. When you went uh, into the temple grounds, you would do so for two reasons usually. You would be there to off offer a sacrifice to God or you'd be there to meet with God, to worship God. And as Jesus walks into the temple area, we find out he's not happy. It says from verse 12, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Jesus has walked into this enormous place, bustling with activity. And he's overturned the tables, he's created a scene. The money changers would be there because they would sell sacrificial animals to people who've had to travel. If you've got to walk uh, 50k to go to Jerusalem to, for the Passover, well, you wouldn't carry all your animals with you, you could just buy them when you got there. That's what these guys are doing. But Jesus seems to be unhappy with what they're doing. It doesn't really specify what he's unhappy with. But I want to suggest that Jesus wants every square inch of the temple grounds devoted to prayer and the devotion and worship of God. Jesus says to them in verse 13, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. It seems so religious and, and, and busy in the temple that day when Jesus arrived. It was all business as usual. And that was the problem. People going through the motions, busy, but, but their hearts were so often not in step with God. They're okay with setting up a farmer's market in the, in the temple of God, just for convenience sake. And Jesus says, no. No. And there are hints here that Jesus wants people to have a genuine, have full access to God and a genuine closeness with God. Not knowledge of an idea of God, but genuine relationship. And we see that in verse 15, when Jesus heals the blind and the lame. That's the last healing miracle Jesus done, does in the Gospel of Matthew. That's the last one. And I want to suggest it's probably important, because it's been inserted here in the middle of all these other things. See, if you had some kind of permanent physical impairment, you had some kind of disease or whatever, 
that it would prevent you from taking full part in the temple activities. You were kind of seen as unclean. You could come into the outer courts, yeah, but just stay over there. But in healing these people, Jesus is enabling them to have access to the temple. He's allowing them to bring a sacrifice, to worship God fully, to be close to God. Matthew mentions this healing because in this temple he's just cleansed. He's showing his heart. He wants people to draw close to God. Even the people that others think are unworthy. Even the people who don't seem to fit the picture. There's something in that, isn't there? In the week leading up to his death, he sees people are excluded and he fixes it. I don't know, there's something in there that's a lesson for all of us. And it's no surprise that after healing these people, we find out that the children have been shouting out, praising Jesus. Verse 15, they've been saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They've been acknowledging what the people outside the city have been acknowledging. Though they might not fully understand who Jesus is, they are welcoming welcoming him as their Messiah. And we see the religious leaders are grumbling. They're questioning. And with that, Jesus leaves and goes to a nearby village. Now, you'll notice in the reading, Jesus comes and goes a few times. Why does he do that? It's because Jerusalem is probably packed. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are streaming into Jerusalem in the lead-up to the Passover. And they go to Bethany and all these other little locales that are quite close because that's where you can get somewhere to stay. It's just easier. It's a big deal. But so far, I hope you're getting the picture of what Matthew's trying to tell us. Who is Jesus? Well, he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's the king who's going to bring peace and blessing forever. And so what's he come to do? Well, he wants people to have access to God. He clears the temple. He heals those who are excluded because he wants people to come close. And I think when we talk to people, when you head out the door, the front door in the morning, you go to work or school or uni, we need to remember the kind of king we serve. I do. He's made a way for people to have closeness with God, even the ones that might seem like they don't fit or maybe they're not that interested. And Jesus has come to give us that closeness with God. And I think he wants us to want that for other people too. To have real closeness with God. Christianity isn't just some rituals and you stand and you sing a song and you sit down again and you say some correct things and have some nice ideas. It's about a real relationship with the God who puts you in this world. The God who has given you every heartbeat. The next morning... On the way back to Jerusalem, you know, he's gone out of town. Okay, he's going back the next day. Jesus is hungry. And he goes up to a fig tree. And even though there's these beautiful, nice, lush leaves, he finds actually there's no fruit. And he gets angry, doesn't he? And he kind of curses the tree. I don't know what he, what he does. To, you know, he uses his power and he zaps the tree because it's got no fruit on it. Verse 19, seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. That's weird, isn't it? Why would Matthew tell us that? I mean, who cares what Jesus wanted for breakfast, right? Who talks to trees anyway? But it's a bit of a strange story. But again, Matthew has mentioned it deliberately because it's the kind of picture of the state of Israel. In the Bible, the fig tree is sometimes a symbol for God's Old Testament people, for Israel. Here's a quote from the prophet Hosea um, that should come up on the screen. It says, When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. Israel is kind of like a fig tree. That's the imagery. And after everything that's happened in Jerusalem in the last few years and especially in the last few days, on the way back to Jerusalem, Jesus finds this symbol of Israel. 
and it's full of leaves. Looks fantastic. And he goes up to it and there's nothing. No fruit. It just looks good. And it's a picture of what he's found over and over again in Israel. Certainly there are many who believe Jesus and some who follow him, but the majority, especially those in authority, don't follow Jesus. They reject him. On Sunday, the crowds cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. But on the Friday, the crowd will cry out, crucify him. The fig tree looks so good that it had no fruit and it withered. And that's a warning to Israel. And I reckon it's a warning to us. External busyness and religion without a deeper internal reality, that's not what God wants. He doesn't want people just jumping through hoops, just doing the do. There's certainly a discipline and a rhythm uh, and a duty in the Christian life. But God wants something deeper. And I think that's why Jesus tells the disciples to pray and believe for things. After that, you probably have heard that verse in, uh, from verse 21. Jesus tells them to believe and you can move mountains. Now, there's a lot that could be said for that. Uh, I would suggest, in one sense, Jesus is looking at the mount of which the temple is, where Jerusalem is. He said, you can say to that mountain, be cast into the sea. Because in not too long, they won't have a need for that temple. But I think, particularly, Jesus is calling for his followers to have a deep, genuine faith, not a facade. Not just showing up, not just words. He wants us to be people who truly seek God and pray and and believe for real friends we need to hear this and i need to hear it because we live in an age of confusion and anxiety people are struggling i got a friend of mine who's just joined a a new unit at the prince charles hospital which has been specifically designed to handle the increasing number of people with mental health concerns our culture is hurting isn't it Our culture is lost. And people know still that they need something. And if you allow me to mention Taylor Swift one more time, and I'm sorry to do this to you, but I think that's why people go to Taylor Swift concerts. That's why there's this big national buzz about her. Because when you go to a concert, you can forget all your troubles. You just have a good time, party, you know, party to the music, enjoy it. You see, when you leave the concert, all those troubles you've just spent a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars forgetting are all right there when you get out to the car park. The questions that you still have, the whys and what ifs, they're all still there, aren't they? And what Matthew's Gospel is saying is there is a superstar and he stands at the centre of history and his name is Jesus Christ. And everything in history either leads up to or leads away from his death and resurrection. He's the promised king who comes to bring blessing and peace, not for a couple of hours at a concert, but forever. He's the one who comes to open real access to God so you can go in and have closeness with God and real relationship with God and know him. You don't need to spend two grand on front row seats to get close. He's right there. He's right here. So you didn't see him when you came in, did you? Oh, it's because he came in with you from the car. He's with you. These are the things that Jesus has achieved. How did he achieve it? Well, in Matthew's Gospel, in a few days, he will be killed, won't he? It'll look like a mistrial, it'll look like a murder, and it is, but it's also the way God has provided to deal with our sin with our deep tendency to doubt, disobey and disregard the God who's put us here. So Jesus comes into the centre of Israel's religious life to offer a sacrifice to save you and to change your life, to bring peace and blessing and closeness with God as you learn to trust him. But he doesn't have to buy an animal at one of those tables. That's not where the sacrifice comes from. See, he's the sacrifice. He is, and he knows it.
Why does he do that? Taylor Swift wouldn't die for you, friends. She'll take your money. She'll entertain you. She's great. Why did Jesus die for you? Because he loves you. Not the person in the chair next to you, the person sitting in your chair. He gets you. He knows what you need. And he works to help and change you. So Jesus entered Jerusalem as king. He went to the cross as king. And he was raised in glory as king. And now today and every day, let him enter whatever's going on in your life. Let him enter as king. In our age of confusion and anxiety, let the peace and blessing and closeness he brings go deep down inside you. Let it light up something very real in the centre of you. Not a facade, but something really real. Let it give you courage to say something helpful to those around you. Friends, we need this good news of who Jesus is and what he came to do because it's the key to understanding who we are and what we're here to do. Why don't we pray? Father, we we marvel when we see Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. As he comes into Jerusalem as a humble king on a donkey. We realise that a lot of people don't understand Jesus or what he came to do. And we, we admit that often we don't really fully understand it either. Please help us to grow deeper in our faith. Please help our relationship with you to not be a a show or a facade, but a growing reality of real closeness with you. And even in the middle of everyday life, we pray that as we take this good news deep inside us, as we learn and believe, we pray we would experience that peace and blessing that we can have in relationship with you. And even in the midst of an anxious and confusing world, Help us to let King Jesus enter into our world, our lives every day. Help us to welcome him into every hurt, every stress, every sadness. We pray that he would humble us and help us. And Father, please do a work in us so we might have the wisdom to share this good news with others in words and also in good works. We pray this praising you once again for King Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Amen.